Good morning everyone from a very beautiful but still very soggy field somewhere in northern England. My name is Michelle, I hope you're doing well and this is episode four of Crime Stories Sunday and oh boy do I have a story for you. I'm going to take you to the 19th century and we're going to discuss the story the myth, the legend, that is H.H. H. Holmes. He was a con artist, a bigamist. <laughs> and he's been awarded the illustrious title of America's first serial killer. Now, guys, I don't for one minute believe he was America's first serial killer. But he's probably the first that hit the headlines in such a big way. Newspapers were vying for sensationalistic stories and headlines just like they are today. The newspaper industry was roaring. They didn't have the internet, so all of the information that the public received was via print media. So let's just say he was America's first sensational serial killer. He's been called the Beast of Chicago. But in fact, his crimes took place all over the United States and Canada. But the big shock horror factor of this story did occur in Chicago. We're going to get into all of that. Now, this is where the myths come in. Because Holmes is judged to have murdered between nine and 200 people, depending on what source you look at. So that's a, a, big, uh, a big range. And we've no idea what the actual figure is. At his confession, Holmes admitted to killing 27 people. But his testimony was so confusing and he would go back on facts. We don't know whether that's true either. But he killed many of his victims in this specially constructed house. Actually, it wasn't a house. It was a hotel over three storeys plus a basement. It is actually the size of an entire block. This was a huge property. Locals at the time called it the castle. Crime writers today call it the murder castle. But I'll give you one caveat before I begin. Because this was a 19th century crime, because it was sensationalised right from day one, over the centuries this has become maybe even more sensationalist than it was at the time. And reports vary widely on different aspects of the story. So I've just kind of combined what is most frequently said and I can't vouch for the historical accuracy of some of it. Don't kind of think of this as a history lesson. This is more the story of the sensation, the myth and the legend that surrounds H.H. H. Holmes. But H.H. H. Holmes wasn't even his real name. <laughs> he went by various aliases to, to be able to commit his crimes. Holmes was born Herman Webster Mudgett on or around May 16th, 1861 in Gilmanton, New Hampshire. To Levi Horton Mudgett and, I don't know how to pronounce this, Theodate, I want to say, Price, both of whom were descended from the first English settlers of New Hampshire. Mudgett was his parents' third-born child. He was actually the middle child. He had two elder siblings who were called Ellen and Arthur, and then two younger siblings who were Henry and Mary. I don't know anything about the lives of these siblings. No idea whether they also went on to lives of crime or whether they were just normal people. We just don't know. That's been lost to time. Mudgett's father 
was from a long line of farmers, farming family. And by all accounts, they were quite wealthy. Levi was a farming trader. He wasn't just a farmer. And he also did various other jobs. He, he had, like, he did house painting, for example. Not that he necessarily needed the money, but he was a hard worker. So Mudgett's early life was one of hmm, relative privilege, I would say. It was said right from his earliest days, he was highly, highly intelligent. Probably, you know, the most intelligent kid of his class. Sometimes, you know, intellectually gifted kids can get bullied. You know, I can imagine Herman as being somewhat nerdy. <laughs> uh, he wasn't a looker. He had a, an eye defect. Didn't affect his sight, but affected the, the way his eyes looked. And we know kids can be incredibly cruel. And they were <laughs> as cruel in the 19th century as they are in schoolyards today. Now, whether that has anything to do with what he went on to do and the horrors, I don't think so. But there's one story that stands out, uh, and I want to mention this, because it may, if it's true, it may have some standing on why Mudgett became obsessed with cadavers, with skeletons, with dissecting the human body. The story goes that the bullies found out that Herman was afraid of doctors. One day, they marched him to a doctor's office and made him stare at a human skeleton. Now, bear in mind, this was the 19th century. You know, it wasn't so outrageous that a human skeleton would have been displayed in a doctor's office. Herman was terrified of this skeleton. But the more he stared at it, the more fascinated he became by it. Almost like a baptism of fire, if you will. It's this fascination with bones, with bodies, that both made his career, because he went to medical school and became a doctor. But also, in large part, it's central to the crimes he went on to commit. After this event, the legend goes that this is when he became obsessed, fascinated, and some reports state that he started to dissect animals. But I don't know whether that's true, whether he did start dissecting animals or whether that's just a modern day add-on to the story to fit this modern perception of serial killers starting off hurting animals. Many of them do, by the way. But he was intellectually gifted, as I said. And at the age of 16, he graduated Phillips Exeter Academy. And uh, he took some teaching jobs in his local town. And he also assisted his father in his farming trading business. So Herman, you know, he was, he was a hard worker, just like his dad. And it's through these farming connections that Herman met the first of his three, or maybe four wives... She was called Clara, and accounts have it that for Herman, it was love at first sight. But she was dating someone. When Herman stood up for her in an argument with her then fiancé, that was enough for Clara to fall for him as well. And on July the 4th, 1878, he married Clara at the tender age of only 17 their son, Robert, Robert Mudgett, was born on February the 3rd, 1880. Herman decided to pursue his fascination with medicine. He enrolled at the University of Vermont in Burlington at the age of 18, but he was dissatisfied with that school and he left after only a year. But then in 1882, he entered the University of Michigan Department of Medicine and Surgery and he graduated there in June 1884, having passed his exams. But this is where we get the first accounts of Herman's violence. Housemates claim that Herman was nasty, was violent towards Clara. And even before his graduation, 
she left him. She moved back to New Hampshire and she later wrote that she heard little from him after that. He actually maintained the marriage with Clara throughout his life. He never divorced her. But while at medical school, Herman started stealing cadavers from the labs. Medical schools were, were not very careful about where they got their cadavers from. You know, because the students, you know, dissected bodies. There weren't the rules and regulations that there are today. And there was a sale in cadavers. You know, have you ever heard the stories of the grave robbers? People who would creep into graveyards late at night, dig up dead bodies and sell them to medical schools. Well, although there's no reports of Herman being a grave robber, he was definitely a cadaver stealer. He'd take them home and he'd burn them, disfigure them. He'd kind of like lay out the bodies as if they died in various ways. And if that's not just a, a perverse fascination, it gets worse. Because Herman was an absolutely brilliant con man, scammer and fraud. Take out insurance policies on these cadavers as if they were alive. And then he'd plant their bodies somewhere, make it look like an accident, and then claim the policy. And he made a lot of money doing this. But anyway, he moved to New York, Moores Forks, New York State. And a rumour spread that he'd been seen with a little boy. And unlike the evil genius that was Israel Keys that we talked about in episode two a couple of weeks ago, Herman had absolutely no problem murdering children. This little boy disappeared. And Holmes claimed that uh, he'd taken him back to his home. But there was no records of any investigation taking place. But Herman quickly left town. Hmm. He travelled to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And here he got a job in a place called Norristown, at Norristown State Hospital. But he quit that after only a few days. Don't know why, but then he later took a position at a drugstore, working in a drugstore. While he was working there, allegedly, a boy died after taking medicine that was purchased at the store. Uh, Herman denied any involvement in the child's death, but <laughs> as something that became a bit of a trademark, he quickly left town. Now, this is how he ended up in Chicago, Illinois. In 1885, Holmes moved to Chicago. And it's unclear exactly when he changed his name from Herman Mudgett to H.H. H. Holmes. And the H.H. H. Didn't, <laughs> didn't always stand for the same thing either. He moved to Chicago... And we know by this time he was definitely signing himself Dr. Henry H. Holmes. Sometimes it was Henry Howard Holmes. Sometimes it was something else. But he was starting to change names to presumably cover up all of these scams that he was engaging in. We've got two conflicting accounts about what happened next. So he got a job at a drugstore and one's version of this story goes that the owner of the drugstore passed away. Herman convinced the widow to let him buy the store, which she did. Some reports, though, say that the widow went missing. Other reports even state that they both went missing. But more reports still saying the owner didn't pass away at all that this sale went through fair and square and the drugstore owners moved on to a new life. <laughs> Maybe they were just sick of running the drugstore. Who knows? Once he became the owner of this drugstore, he purchased an empty lot, uh, actually a block. This was the beginnings of the murder hotel. So let's spend a little bit of time explaining 
exactly what went down here. What he did was he designed all this himself and uh, it was a three-storey hotel, although it, it didn't operate for very long at all as a hotel. In the neighbourhood, though, it was by far the biggest construction in the area, like owned by like one person. And it became known as the castle. And then it's the later sensationalism <laughs> that surrounds this story that it became known as the murder castle. He hired and fired construction workers at will. Allegedly, if anybody asks any questions about why, why all these rooms, why all these strange configuration, he fired them. He'd, he'd just bring different teams in to work on very specific and small aspects of the project so that nobody became suspicious. Now, after this construction was complete, and we'll get into what this actually looked like in a minute, or at least what the legend tells us it looks like. But after construction was complete in 1891, Holmes placed adverts in newspapers offering jobs to young women, advertising the castle as a place of lodging and as a place of work. The whole kind of ground floor, like the street level, was shops. So there was a jewellery, a drugstore, there was a whole like row of shops. So he needed employees for the shops. In some of these ads, he'd present himself as a wealthy man looking for a wife. <laughs> and uh, we just don't know how many young women applied for jobs, how many went missing after applying for jobs, how many people replied to the ad as a potential wife, and indeed, how many of these women did he agree to marry? How many of them escaped? How many of them died? We just don't know. But we do know that Holmes was still married to Clara, as I said before. There's no evidence at all that he divorced her when he married his second and his third wives. His next wife was someone called Myrta. He married her in 1886. And he had a daughter called Lucy with Myrta. He lived with Myrta and Lucy outside of the city. And he used the castle as his place of work. So he very much led a double life, a little bit like Israel Keyes. That he was this respectable husband and father businessman. He was a bigamist, but they didn't die. They, they weren't murdered. Some stories say that his third wife was actually someone called... Minnie Williams. They certainly posed as husband and wife, but whether they were actually married, I guess it doesn't matter really. But he met her in early 1893 when she moved to Chicago and he offered her a job at the hotel as his personal stenographer and she accepted. Minnie had some money. She'd been left some property by relatives and he persuaded her to transfer the deed to all of this property that was all the way down in Fort Worth, in Texas. And uh, he got her, not to just sign it over to him, no, no, there was a scam involved here, to sign it over to someone called Alexander Bond. But this was actually just another alias of Holmes. There was no Alexander Bond. And to cover up the scam even more, Holmes, or rather Alexander, signed it over to someone called Benton T. Lynham. He was actually an alias of Holmes's dodgy business partner, Benjamin Peitzel. More on him in a little while, because he met a sorry end, as did his family. Holmes and Williams, presenting themselves as husband and wife, rented an apartment in Chicago. And then Minnie's sister was persuaded to pay a visit, because she owned property as well, and Holmes was greedy. So the last time both Minnie and the sister, Nanny, were seen alive was July 1893. Holmes managed, due to these deaths, or rather these murders, that all of the property that the Williams sisters owned became his, down in Texas. Holmes's third wife, or was it fourth wife, was someone called Georgiana. He married her in... 1894, when still married to both Clara and Myrta. 
And she was the one who was married to him, completely unsuspecting when he was finally arrested. But let's concentrate now on the murder castle. All of Holmes' employees, hotel guests, fiancés, wives, God knows who, were all required to have life insurance policies as like, you know, part of their employment. They had to have a policy. And Holmes persuaded them to do this by paying the premiums. You know, as a, what a great boss. <laughs> you know, I even, even pays my life insurance. Well, that was, that was a downfall for many of these acquaintances because some of them would just suddenly disappear. Women would just enter the hotel and would never come back out. So people were suspicious back then. But <sighs> who could prove what? So one of Holmes's earliest recorded murder victims at the hotel was his mistress, Julia. Now, as well as having multiple wives, he also had multiple mistresses as well. Now, she was the wife of someone called Ned, who'd moved into the building, the castle, and began working at his uh, jewellery counter, his jewellery store. But after Ned found out about the affair, Ned just upped and left and said, you're welcome to her, mate. Unfortunately, though, for Julia, and she had a daughter, Pearl, this would be her demise. Julia and Pearl disappeared on Christmas Eve of 1891. And Holmes later claimed that she died during an abortion. But what truly happened to both Julia and Pearl has been lost to time. Holmes had various ways that he would like to kill people. One of his preferred ways, though, was suffocation. And he might do that by overdosing them with chloroform. He might do that through these carefully constructed gas chambers that he had. Oh, sometimes just being trapped in an airless vault. I mean, this is just astonishingly cruel. <sighs> he also claimed at confession that he would starve people to death. He would burn people. I mean, there's just some horrific stories he told. But how much of this was his own embellishment and how much of it was true? Or was the truth even more disturbing? Even though this, this story can't get any more disturbing. But anyway, the real horror began. In 1893, Chicago was given the honour of hosting the World Fair, which was a cultural and social event to celebrate the 400th anniversary of Columbus's discovery of America. So the event was scheduled from May to October and it attracted millions of visitors to Chicago from, from all over the world. So when Holmes heard that the World's Fair was coming to Chicago, he took this as a business opportunity. And this is the time when he actually opened the hotel to, to the public, you know, rather than just yeah. having lodgers. This became an opportunity for money to be made for people to go missing and for Holmes to exercise his perverse pleasure of killing people. But let's talk about this castle. You've waited long enough. It, it literally created an elaborate house of horrors. You'd open doors and it would just be solid brick behind them. You'd enter a bedroom and suddenly smell gas seeping in. Many of the rooms were internal rooms that had no windows and no way out. There were staircases leading to nowhere. So even if you tried to escape, you'd know where to run. Corridors would like double back on each other. It was just like a maze of horror. And that was the entire second floor. The first floor, the street level, was the shops, as I've already mentioned. The second floor was the murder floor or the hotel. And then the third floor was Holmes's kind of personal suite, his offices, etc. 
But then there was the basement, because in the basement there was torture equipment and there was a crematorium. He had a crematorium built in the basement, or so the story goes. But there was over 100 rooms that were used, both as living quarters, as the hotel, and as murder rooms. And no one could hear you scream, because these were soundproofed. They contained gas lines, so as homes desired or required, you could just turn the gas on from his, the comfort of his office, the comfort of his own apartments, whenever he felt like it. It's recorded that there was trap doors, peepholes, stairways, chutes, that he could just throw a body down a chute directly into the basement. And this basement, like I said, had tor torture, just a torture chamber. It was his own personal lab. You know, he could dissect his bodies. He could lay them out. He could play with them. But he'd even make money off these dead bodies, right? Because he had the insurance policies on them. But also, he'd strip the bodies down and sell the skeletons to medical schools. Because, as I said before, medical schools were unscrupulous back then. Right, he'd strip the flesh off the bones in vats of acid, in nice clean bones, sold to medicine. But once the World's Fair had ended, Chicago's economy went into somewhat of a slump. And it's at this point that Holmes abandoned the castle. So he'd spent like years getting it in, in the way that he wanted it as his personal playground and just a big moneymaker. But he abandoned it. He left Chicago, and for a while he focused on insurance scams. Yeah, maybe he committed random murders whenever he felt like it. He went to Fort Worth, because remember, Minnie and Nanny Williams, he got their property, Fort Worth, Texas. Well, he went there. And on the way, he collected another wife, Georgiana. He met her in Colorado on his travels. Now, there is reports that on the property in Fort Worth, he made hmm, maybe a half-hearted attempt to build another murder castle. But eh, maybe, maybe he'd been done with that. Maybe that was too much like hard work to do all that again. Who knows? But he, he didn't go through with it. Instead, as I said, he focused on insurance scams and theft. Good old-fashioned theft. He stole horses from Texas, you know, a big horse state, Texas, and he would ship them up to St. Louis and sell them and making a fortune selling these horses. These sales, these, these thefts became part of his downfall. As part of one of these scams, he was arrested in uh, 1894 and briefly jailed, briefly jailed on charge of selling stolen goods. But he was bailed out. He was able to pay bail. And, uh, and he went on his merry way. He skipped bail, by the way. Well, he had this brief span, though, in jail. He struck up a conversation with a convicted Wild West outlaw called Marion Hedgepeth who was serving a 25-year sentence, so he had nothing to lose, nothing to lose at all. And they concocted a plan to swindle an insurance company out of $10,000, which was a massive amount of money back in the 1890s. So the plan was to take a policy out on himself and then fake his death. And if Hedgepeth would help him, and kind of put him in touch with a lawyer who was dodgy and stuff. It, then, you know, he'd fake his own death, he'd disappear. But the insurance company got suspicious. Obviously, we're on the ball. <laughs> and uh, they didn't pay out. So, Hedgepeth didn't get his cut of this $10,000. And he was annoyed at this. And he started to talk. He started to talk to the authorities, to the police. 
about some of the things that Holmes had told him. I don't know what Holmes told him, but the police were on to him. And he had an outstanding warrant, remember? He'd skipped bail. He now became a wanted man, and this was the beginning of the end for Holmes. But he liked this idea of this $10,000 insurance scam, and he decided that, you know, <laughs> you know, it failed one time, but it might not fail a second time. And he decided to go ahead with this, with a little bit of refinement, with his business partner, Benjamin Peitzel. So he made a plan with Benjamin, so Peitzel would fake his death and collect the $10,000. The scheme was going to take place in Philadelphia and uh, here Peitzel would set himself up as an inventor under the name B.F. Perry and then he'd be killed and disfigured when one of his inventions backfired on him in an explosion. You know, so disfigured that an insurance company wouldn't suspect, right? Because you didn't have DNA in those days, right? And Holmes is part of this deal was to find a cadaver that was like the same size and weight so that if the insurance company did ask questions, then they'd be placated, right? He'd learned from his previous mistake. Instead, however, instead of taking the trouble to find an appropriate cadaver, he murdered Peitzel. Benjamin Peitzel trusted him all of those years, was, you know, cashing in on Holmes's scams. But he became a victim. One of the last victims, actually. Allegedly knocked him unconscious with chloroform and then set his body on fire and, and played out this so-called lab explosion that they'd originally planned. So, Holmes collected the insurance payout on the basis of the genuine Peitzel corpse. But then, unfortunately, Holmes went on to manipulate Peitzel's widow by allowing three of her children, Alice, Nellie and Howard, to be placed in his custody. Their eldest daughter and the baby remained with Mrs Peitzel. But Holmes and the three Peitzel children travelled throughout the northern United States and up into Canada. Simultaneously, I don't know how he did this. I don't know how he had enough hours in the day. And how he managed to travel all of these miles. He must have never slept. Because simultaneously to transporting these three children, he was also escorting Mrs. Peitzel along a parallel route. All the while, kind of travelling from place to place using various alias aliases. Because remember, he was on the run, lying to Mrs. Peitzel concerning her husband's death. Lying to her about the whereabouts of her children, he said that Peitzel was in London, Canada, not London, England, London, Canada. Maybe that's how he got her to hand over three of her kids. He was just a master manipulator, as many psychopaths are. Holmes was also living with his wife, Georgiana, at the time. So he, he, he like had Peitzel's three kids in one location, Mrs. Peitzel in another, and completely unsuspecting Georgiana in yet another, unaware of anything that was going on. <sighs> Sadly, though, Holmes would later confess to murdering Alice and Nellie, the two Peitzel daughters, by forcing them into a large trunk, locking them inside. He drilled a hole in the lid, and, and he put a hose through the hole, and and asphyxiated them with gas. Uh, and he buried the new bodies in a cellar of his rental home in St Vincent in Toronto, Canada. One of the detectives, um, a Philadelphia police officer called Frank Geyer, was assigned to investigate Holmes and, uh, and find these missing children eventually. And allegedly it was him that found the heavily decomposed bodies. In this, uh, in this Toronto home. And Detective Gaia is alleged to have wrote, the deeper we dug, the more horrible the order became. And when we reached the depths of three feet, we discovered what appeared to be the bone of a forearm of a human being. Little did he know that that was, <laughs> that was the very, very least of the horrors 
that uh, Holmes had uh, committed over the over the few years that he was operating these uh, scams and stuff. So Holmes had rented a cottage in Indianapolis and he was reported to have visited a local pharmacy, purchased the drugs which he used to kill Howard, the Pikesville son. And uh, his bones were found in that cottage's chimney. Holmes' murder spree finally ended when he was arrested in Boston on November the 17th, 1894, after being tracked there from Philadelphia by the police who were now very, very concerned about what this guy was up to. And he was held because he had this outstanding warrant, remember, from these stolen goods for horse theft. So a horse took him down, eventually, so to speak. During his time in custody, he gave numerous stories to police. As I said earlier, once admitting to 27 people. Why 27? Don't know. Sounds like an oddly accurate number. And police believed him until they started to investigate the names of these victims and... Some of them were actually still alive. So was Holmes just having one final hurrah? Just one final joke, a laugh with the police? In October 1895, Holmes was put on trial for the murder of Benjamin Pikesell and found guilty and sentenced to death. He appealed, but that was denied. It was by then evident that Pikesell's death wasn't the only one. There was the kids... There was three kids that were found as part of this investigation. But as he was already sentenced to death, well, death's pretty final. It doesn't really matter what the final body count was if you're going to hang anyway, I guess. But uh, after the discovery of these children's bodies, the police contacted authorities in Chicago and they started to investigate this old castle, the murder castle. This is where claims become, I think, sensationalised. I think the press wanted as good a story as possible. Uh, More modern historians will say, was there really evidence of all of this torture stuff? Was there really evidence of all of these really intricate plans? The media at the time wanting to sell as many newspapers as possible. Maybe. Maybe the murder castle didn't even exist in this really sensationalised form that it's been passed down to us today. But Holmes died by hanging on May the 7th, 1896. In an ironic twist of fate, well, there's two twists of fate. (laughs) First of all, Holmes' neck did not break and instead he strangled slowly, twitching for over 15 minutes before finally being pronounced dead. He was buried in an unmarked grave in Philadelphia. Now, here's the irony. His final wish, which was accepted, he got his final wish, was for his coffin to be contained in cement and buried a double depth, so 10 feet, because he was so concerned about grave robbers and about his corpse being mutilated and used for dissection. And and I think that maybe goes back to this childhood fear he had of bodies, of skeletons. Maybe the morbid fascination that he had was this baptism of fire he had when the bullies took him to that doctor's office and he was so scared that he projected this fear as a defence mechanism, and it all played out. He externalised all this anger and fear and horror that he felt, and he projected it onto other people. I don't know, that's just my suggestion. I, I don't know what you feel about that. The castle itself was mysteriously gutted by fire in August 1895. Was it one of his victims, victims' families, who destroyed it, burnt it to the ground? According to a newspaper clipping from the New York Times, two men were seen entering the back of the building between 8 and 9 p.m. About half an hour later, they were seen exiting the building and running away. 
Following several explosions, the castle went up in flames. Afterwards, investigators found a half-empty gas can underneath the back steps of the building. But the building survived and it remained in use, actually, until it was torn down in 1938 and it then became a post office. Holmes has got surviving descendants. His great-grandchildren or great-great-grandchildren speculate that he might have been Jack the Ripper. You know, the London, England killer who's never been... His identity's never been found. The women that he killed, he kind of gutted them and was able to take organs out. But I think that's just one speculation too many, in my opinion. There's no evidence that I could find that Holmes went to England. Maybe the confusion is London. That reports said that he went to London. But that was London, Canada, in Ontario, not London, England. I don't know. But in 2017, amid allegations that Holmes had in fact escaped capture and had escaped execution, and that this was another scam, that he'd faked his own death and someone had been executed on his behalf, his body was actually exhumed, led by the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. They were able to take DNA from his existing relatives compare it to the DNA in the bones, and hey presto, yes it was, it was Holmes. But it's interesting that due to this coffin being encased in concrete and being 10 foot under the ground, it hadn't decomposed normally. It hadn't been exposed to any elements at all. His clothes were almost perfectly preserved. His moustache was found intact. But anyway, his, it, it was him. Confirmed teeth, DNA, blah, blah, blah. It was him. He did die. He did hang for at least one of his crimes. And therein is a horrific, horrific story of Dr. H.H. H. Holmes. How he got away, even though it was the 19th century, how he got away with so many scams and so much for so long. Beggar's belief. And even though people were suspicious of all these people going in and not coming out of this hotel, he wasn't stopped. And bizarrely, a relatively minor crime of stealing goods stealing horses and jumping bail for a minor crime. I mean, I say minor crime, you know. Texas is a pretty, pretty hard-nosed state. He didn't want to go back there. He didn't want to go back there. So he, he legged it. What do you think, guys? Let me know your thoughts and opinions below. Let me know any further cases you'd like me to cover during this series. I'll be back same time, same place, 8pm UK time for episode 5 of Crime Stories Sunday. I don't think I'm going to be able to top this case for sensationalism. <laughs> Not for a very, very, very long time. Anyway, I'm going to go home now and dry my feet and bath this one. Bye guys.